Today we're going to discuss some of the recent discoveries coming from Jupiter and of course its moons. Actually, I guess it's mostly from its moons. And mostly from the Juno mission that have been orbiting the system for the past few years. But also recent observations from the James Webb Space Telescope that actually made some really incredible discoveries on the surface of some of these moons. With at least one of these discoveries being really mysterious, potentially suggesting maybe life? Anyway, how wonderful person, this is Anton, let's discuss Jupiter, let's talk about the discoveries from the Galilean moons, and obviously discuss why a lot of these discoveries are kind of important. And let's start with the biggest moon of Jupiter, and actually the biggest moon in the entire solar system, Ganymede. The moon that's so big and so complex that if it wasn't orbiting Jupiter, it would definitely be its own planet. The moon whose surface seems to be dominated by two specific types of terrain, either bright or dark. The bright stuff seems to be mostly ice with a lot of grooves, and seems to be approximately two-thirds of the entire surface, with the remaining one-third being the dark stuff. But underneath all of this, there is quite a lot of ice, but there is also what seems to be a silicon mantle very similar to planet Earth. It also potentially has some kind of an underground ocean, but more importantly, also contains an extremely thin atmosphere. And of course, magnetosphere as well, and that by itself makes it very unique. It's also bigger than Mercury, so yeah, it's basically a planet, making this an extremely fascinating moon to study. And so very recently Juno conducted an infrared analysis of its surface in the process of discovering a huge amount of mineral salts, organic compounds, and all sorts of chemical fingerprints that nobody expected right here on the surface of this moon. And most importantly, it found a huge amount of complex organic molecules and very complex salts normally associated with complex chemistry in various latitudes protected by the magnetic field. With the conclusion being that these are probably emissions from the underground ocean and specifically some kind of a salty ocean that seems to be concentrated in salts and organic molecules. With a lot of compounds detected, suggesting a very active chemical interaction between rocks, liquid water, and various rock compounds found inside Ganymede, naturally suggesting very complex chemistry underneath the surface of the moon, chemistry that at least theoretically could produce life. And so this was already a pretty exciting discovery, but at least for now, just the first discovery from Ganymede. A much more exciting discovery came from Ganymede's neighbor, Europa, probably the most fascinating moon orbiting Jupiter. And here the observations were conducted by the James Webb Space Telescope that's of course extremely good at detecting a lot of infrared signatures from various objects. Here's actually what the raw observation of all of this looked like, this is before being processed. And in this image there was a lot of data hidden that sort of, kind of, nobody expected. In essence, it revealed a large amount of CO2 ice, basically carbon dioxide ice detected at various frequencies and in very large amounts on the surface of the moon. Ok, carbon dioxide, CO2, what's the big deal? How is that even important? The stuff is everywhere. Well, in this case, it's important for one simple reason. It was detected on the surface of the moon, and was detected both in crystalline form, or basically ice, and amorphous form, which is sort of like ice but more disorganized. I guess technically you can call it carbon dioxide glass. And in this type of a form, when exposed to powerful radiation and a lot of sunlight, CO2 should not really survive for a long time. It does not remain stable on the surface and should have already been converted into something else or evaporated completely, with a lot of it concentrated in a very specific region known as Tara Regio, a location where previously scientists have also discovered signs of various water plumes, or basically water vapor erupting from the surface. This region is famous and is also known as the Chaos Terrain. It contains huge amounts of ridges and cracks that are quite large in size and look absolutely astonishing. And so what exactly does all of this mean? Well, there are three possible answers to where this ice came from, mostly because it just cannot survive long on the surface. Either asteroids, so basically some kind of a collision with the surface, which might have delivered some of this ice, and you can see there are some craters on the surface, but in this case it doesn't explain why there is so much of it everywhere. The other possibility is some kind of a chemistry we don't still understand that can maybe produce CO2 naturally through some kind of interaction with the molecule on the surface. That would require a lot of chemical analysis and there is currently no explanation for any of this. And then there is the Occam's razor, the easiest explanation. It's coming from within the moon, 
from the internal ocean inside the moon itself. And it's of course coming out as a CO2 gas. And though there is of course a possibility that a lot of this is formed naturally through some kind of a geological process, a lot of scientists got super excited about this discovery because as we know from planet Earth, from ocean life in planet Earth, CO2 is also produced by life. And so some of this gas could be coming from the ocean underneath as a lot of life uses some of these carbon molecules within the moon and then expels it in the process. And because the carbon cycle in this case is pretty well understood, by analyzing the carbon molecules with a little bit more detail, it might actually even become possible to find out if this is carbon dioxide coming from life sources or from something more inorganic. At the moment, nobody really knows, but just the detection of this carbon on the surface is already super, super exciting. Once again, increasing the likelihood for life to possibly exist inside this moon. Then we have more observations from Io. Io is of course the closest and the most volcanic moon in the entire solar system and was recently the target for some of these absolutely incredible shots by the Juno mission. And here, one of the main points for a lot of studies was to essentially figure out where the volcanoes are coming from and of course maybe find out how many there are, like in total in terms of activity. And the answer to that last question is now 266. Turns out there are 266 active volcanoes across the entire surface of the moon. But here the scientists didn't just count the volcanoes, they also discovered their overall power, basically plotting it on this image. And they did this for a very intriguing reason. There were several competing theories trying to explain the origin of volcanism on Io. And one of them suggested that Io contains an extremely massive magma ocean right underneath the surface that's basically powering all of this. So yeah, instead of a typical water ocean like on other moons, this one has magma. But this model was based on a very specific distribution of volcanoes on the surface. Specifically, the model suggested that the polar volcanoes, the ones on the north and the south pole, should actually generate much less energy than the ones in the lower latitudes. And even more so, the volcanoes on the south pole should actually be even less powerful than the ones on the north pole. So basically here the point was not just the distribution of volcanoes, but also their overall strength compared to the overall latitude and the location on the surface. And that's because this model predicts that if the heat flow is coming from inside the moon, the polar regions should actually have much more powerful volcanoes. But if there is a magma ocean and the actual heat is coming from just under the surface, then we expect the polar volcanoes to be much weaker and the equatorial volcanoes to be much stronger. Which is precisely what the scientists discovered after the detailed analysis was complete following the release of these super detailed images by the Juno mission. Also suggesting that the ocean itself is very likely at least 50 kilometers in depth. So yeah, that's pretty cool. There's literally an ocean of magma right underneath the surface of Io and it's really, really deep. Responsible for all of the volcanism on the surface and for making this moon so active and so unusual. You can find out the details in one of the studies in the description. And then we have some additional discoveries from Jupiter itself. Yeah, unfortunately, there is nothing from the fourth moon, Callisto. I guess maybe next time. But when it comes to Jupiter, there were, I guess, two discoveries. One kind of cool and visual, and one sort of more scientific. And the cool one in this case is once again by an amateur astronomer or independent astronomer who is basically just observing Jupiter from his backyard. This is actually Japanese astronomer Tadao Osugi, whose channel you can find in the description, who captured an enormous explosion on the surface of Jupiter, most likely because some kind of an asteroid hit the southern regions. Now we've seen this many times before, but this is actually one of the most detailed observations so far. It actually shows us this huge explosion that's practically a fraction of the size of planet Earth that lasted for a few minutes and disappeared afterwards. Although here this shouldn't really come as a surprise because we expect Jupiter to swallow a lot of stuff all the time. It's just not really seen all the time. I mean, this is the most massive planet in the entire solar system, so we expect it to collect most asteroids, most dust, and most of everything. So these sort of collisions are definitely expected. But still impressive because this was captured in real time, and these are actual images, which unfortunately turned out to be just a little bit blurry because this was automated. But still, cool stuff. And then we have some more scientific stuff coming from various regions right here, inside these beautiful storm regions on the surface of Jupiter. Now, first of all, these unusual storms inside these very unusual stripes of Jupiter are actually still not understood very well, but by observing this in more detail with James Webb Space Telescope, and specifically focusing on these 
alternating bands of light and dark cloud, known as zones and belts, scientists revealed something else nobody knew existed. Additional jets or additional storms inside these belts, all of them approximately 5,000 kilometers or 3,000 miles in length, and moving ridiculously fast. Basically something like 500 kilometers per hour or 320 miles per hour. But also clearly located much higher than the Jupiter's clouds, at least 20 kilometers above them. And so here there's basically a discovery of a new type of a storm we never knew about, with at least three detected in new images moving really really fast across Jupiter, for reasons nobody knows. And in this case the I guess surprise here is that these are just really fast, really powerful and relatively large. We're talking about something that's about 5000 kilometers in length. Basically confirming once again that there are so many mysteries about these gas giants we still cannot explain. But at least for now, these are some of the main discoveries coming from Jupiter in just the last few months, and you can learn about additional discoveries from the early 2023 in some of the videos in the description. On that note, we'll come back and talk more about Jupiter once more discoveries are made. Thank you for watching, subscribe, share this with someone who has learned about space and sciences, come back tomorrow to learn something else, support this channel on Patreon by joining channel membership, or by buying the wonderful person t-shirt you can find in the description. Stay wonderful, I'll see you tomorrow, and as always, bye-bye.